Now we are recording. Okay. All right. So we're using Zoom, guys. Um, eventually, we're going to be posting this, and you'll be seeing it from another facet, probably YouTube or something of that nature. But um, we have around 600 handlers, active duty handlers, across all the different branches um, down at Lackland, you know, stateside, Oconus, and stuff like that. And I put out a questionnaire saying, who would you guys want to hear from? Um, there's Michael Ellis, there's Forrest Mickey, there's Bart on there. There's these people all across the world. And the person that got the most hits on there <laughs> was you, Doc. I'll Stuart what, Hillier. I love having my name come up in association with Bart Ballone and Michael Ellis. That, that's a feel good for me. Yeah, man. And I was like, well, I don't know how much Doc's on the internet these days, but I'll try <laughs> to get a hold of them. I try and, to keep uh, see if we can get something together. So we're here. Yeah, I do too. And you know, this is my first time using Zoom, but I really do like it. So a lot of people have heard your name. You've been to the dog program forever, longer than I've been alive. You've been putting your hands on dogs. <laughs> um, for those don't know, don't know all the specifics or kind of more than just the name Doc. Could you tell me a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your history? Okay, I, I started training dogs in about 1980. And for 10 years, I was a, a sportsman training Schutzhund dogs and, and competing and stuff. Uh, not with a great deal of success, but I did it. And uh, also, I began training pet clients' dogs to make money and also uh, training police department dogs. Uh, then at about age 30, my back started to hurt and I thought to myself, I can't, you know, my livelihood can't depend on being able to agitate dogs for the rest of my life because I'm already breaking down. So I need to go get a profession. So I went to uh, the graduate program at the University of Texas uh, in behavioral neuroscience, which in my flavor was just a fancy expression for learning. And I did a PhD there, nothing to do with dogs, but I did a PhD there. And then as a kind of a coincidence, at some point during my graduate career, uh, my supervisor said, hey, I got this weird phone call from an Air Force base in, in uh, San Antonio. And they want somebody to come and talk to them about learning. And I don't know anything about dogs. Why don't you do it? So I was like, okay. And so I took the gig and I did a little talk and it was, it was kind of funny. I was waiting for somebody to come up afterwards and you know, tell me I was great and offer me further opportunities or whatever. And the only person that came up to me was a Navy chief who said, I want to take you out to lunch, right? And being the dumb shit that I am, wow. you know, who knows, I could be working for the Navy now. That being the dumb shit that I am, I thought I might get a better offer. So I said, you know, hang on, let me, let me see what else comes in. Figuratively, that's what I say. Nothing else came in and yeah. he was gone. So, so I wound up driving back to um, Austin with no input on my talk, thinking, well, that was a huge waste of time. That didn't do me any good at all. But a couple of years later, when uh, they, they had, they were starting a program of research, they needed contractors to do the research on detector dog um, psychophysics and on breeding, and they need somebody to run a breeding program, stuff like that. I got the phone call because they knew of me. And that, that's wow. how I wound up at Lackland. I, I got there in 1998 and I have been there ever since. Wow. 20, yeah, 22 years. Yeah. 20, 22 <laughs> years. Nobody's, nobody's more, nobody's more surprised than I am that a, I can hold a job and B I can hold a job for that long. <laughs> yeah. And you're not completely broke. You're out there still decoying and stuff. I see all the time. <laughs> I do. I do it at a limp and I don't travel real far. So you've obviously met a ton of handlers and trainers throughout this process, a wide array. Um, but do you still keep up with anyone? Is, do you have any mentors or any continued learning that you really stick to? Anything that kind of inspires um, you still? Yeah, my, my studies of working dogs aren't as systematic as they should be. I mean, I should be reading all the time and looking at videos all the time and stuff like that. But I'm too busy riding motorcycles and fucking off. So, um, but I can tell you a list of people that kind of historically have really influenced me. Some of them are still around and our uh, you know, contact with them and learning about them is enormously valuable to serious work dog guys. So uh, I'm gonna flip to, I have some notes that I'm gonna put up on the screen. It shouldn't disturb your ability to see me. 
and uh, okay. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go through my notes. So, so I'll, I'll go way back. And if I do something weird, like I start picking my nose or the thing turns and I'm not on screen anymore, let me know, okay? Because I'm blind right now. I'm just looking at a document. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, all right, so uh, to go way, way back, I'm gonna mention a guy named Len Masana. And Len Masana was a police dog trainer in the United States before European influence had taken over the United States. Len Masana was a guy who trained police dogs in his own American system with his own kind of language and all that sort of stuff. And Len Masana, well, I won't call him an asshole, but um, he and I were not friends from the very start. He was, he was a really short guy and I'm a really tall guy and I think he resented that. And also he was just really kind of a pugnacious, aggressive guy. And uh, so I went to a seminar of his, we're talking 1981 or something like that. I went to a seminar of his and um, at some point he was giving some lecture and basically to put it another way, this is the first guy I ever saw do what I call a threat approach on a dog. Where, because back in my day, the way we threatened a dog was like yell at him and act like you're gonna hit him with a stick and stuff like that. The idea of using eye contact and immobility and expansion of body size as threats, as social threats, uh -huh. completely new. And so Len Masana picks my ass in, in the, the classroom and does a threat approach on me, <laughs> right? And he made me uncomfortable, right? Uh -huh. like after, after he crept up on me after a couple minutes with me pretending it didn't bother me, guess what? It bothered me. That's how, that's how strong threat is. So, and, and I kind of bring Len Masana up because uh, he was controversial. He used to do bite work on dummies. One of the coolest things he did was what we used to call Ho Chi Minh trails, where you'd set up a trail through the woods with a bunch of problems you take your dog through, usually your sport dog, your poor sport dog. And you'd take your, your dog through and scary shit would happen. You'd see how the, how the dog would do. One of them was a dummy swinging down a, sure. down on a rope directly into the handler and dog and stuff like that. And Len Masana did a lot of work on, on dummies. And at one, you know, like mannequins, right? And at, at one point, he came over and hung his elbow over the, over the fence and said, you don't think much of my dummy work, do you? <laughs> I was like, well, Len, no, no, I don't. <laughs> but but the, it's, it's worth mentioning because you should listen to everybody. I've gotten really, really important ideas from people that I don't think of as my mentors. It's just somebody I had contact with. And Len Masana was one of those. Uh, really, he gave me a really, really important insight that I still depend upon, and most other people do too. Is and he he didn't write any books, he didn't do any videos. This was before all that stuff, so his influence is completely gone. I can't even remember the words that he used to use. Um, but it was it was not like any of the terms that, that we use now. Didn't talk about defense. Didn't talk about aggression. Didn't talk about that stuff. We didn't we didn't have that language at that time. We worked everything over aggression, but we didn't know it was aggression. We didn't know the distinction between aggression and prey and all that kind of stuff. So that all changed in about 1983 because uh, a guy named Helmut Reiser came to the United States and taught a seminar uh, sponsored by my little Schutzhund club in, in Parker, Colorado. And um, it was a real small gathering. We had a huge snowstorm and Helmut Reiser was this absolutely brilliant, still is. He's, he's like an enfant terrible, he's still, he's still shaking things up. But he was a really, really smart German dentist. And dentists are a big deal in, in Germany. They are big time prospective professionals. He was super smart, he was a deadly serious working dog guy. And he won the German Leistungsbundesliga Prüfung, the working dog championship, twice with dogs that he raised from puppyhood. So, so this guy was legit, really re legit. When he came, and, and the other thing is he worked according to a theory. He had done a fair amount of reading uh, in behavior, ethology, some learning, stuff like that, and put together a theoretical model for how working dogs are trained, why they behave the way they do, why they respond to the stimuli the way they do, what stimuli are useful, what stimuli are less useful, all that kind of stuff. So he had a the theoretical model. At the time, I lacked a theoretical model. And the import of a theoretical model is it's, it's what helps you go 
from training dog A to training dog B with the same principles, but of course, you can't use exactly the same operations because it's a different dog. What enables you to stick with those principles is you have a theoretical structure. Same way, training dog A at point one and then training him again at point B three weeks later, again, you're gonna need your theoretical structure because it's not gonna be the same dog. So he came with a theoretical structure and a set of expressions, a language. And everyone the world over now uses this language. Like within, within six months of riser hit in the United States, I could go to a dog training club in Texas or Seattle or some damn place like that. And they'd all be talking about defense, aggression, and prey. These words weren't in the English lexicon of working dog terms. And, and these ideas were not there. Uh, so riser changed the world. Um, and he's still doing prominent things. Uh, he, he, he doesn't, he's not a big fan of the SV, the German Shepherd Dog Club of Germany, because they're more involved in creating pretty dogs now than working dogs. Tried to start his own uh, organization for breeding and registering working dogs. You know, he's still shaking things up. But he wrote a very good book, which has been translated into English. And it's one of the important books that somebody should read. Like it's part of the basic canon. Of working, we we're, were talking about uh, Helmut Reiser, and I said that um, Helmut Reiser wrote a book. It's been translated into English. It's a real thin book with a, a very dense with important material, and um, one of the and it's got some great photographs. A couple of the photographs show these guys' dogs, like Reiser and his sport training partners, show their dogs biting the crap out of people. And, and the point was um, that Riser at that time was mistaken as one of the people from the nudely developed <laughs> prey training tradition. And what prey training was, and still is, is the idea that you're going to allow the dog's primarily, primary psychological involvement during work on a man to be with the equipment. His, relation, his primary relationship is with the equipment, not with the man. And for technical reasons, that winds up stimulating prey behavior, and you have you basically have a prey dog. And so uh, the fear at that time in the SV of Germany was that when when prey training was very controversial, the the fear at the time was that the prey trained dogs would start winning trophies. They'd be the only dogs anybody bred their bitches to, and after a few years, the German Shepherd dogs would go down the tubes, and they wouldn't have serious dogs anymore. So Riser who, as I said, was an enfant, enfant terrible and liked to mess with people, who brought his dog Drexler to the podium to accept his first prize in the Leistungsbundesgeprüfung in a muzzle? <laughs> That's a statement. Like, in, in the German Shepherd world, a judge can't touch my dog because it's not safe. That's a big statement. It caused a huge controversy. So... The last thing Riser wanted to be thought of was as a, as a prey trainer, even though he made very extensive use of prey to build what he wanted in the dog. And so one of the ways that they, they made the point in the book was by taking photographs of their sport dogs, uh, Riser and his, his training partners, biting the crap out of people. So there's, there, are two, there are two photographs. One of a dog latched onto the back of a guy's leg in leather bite pants, because this is, you know, 80s Schutzhund. There were no white suits. Uh, hidden sleeves were kind of rare and, and uh, a sort of a uh, kind of a fringe thing to do. And people just taught the dogs to bite here, and that was all. And so they had no equipment. They just wore the leather bite pants that we always used to use when, when training dogs. And they're, they're called bite pants just because they stop the teeth, but they don't stop anything else. It hurts like hell. Um, and so there's this guy getting the back of his leg, just full mouth, crushing bite on the back of his leg in leather pants. Then there's another guy getting bitten on the chest in the leather pants. And the way they decided who was going to do that work is that Riser and his training partner, Gunter Vosshausen, I think it was Gunter Vosshausen, like flipped a coin and said, it's you, dude. You're taking the bites. <laughs> and... Um, so, so that was the thing about, that was an interesting thing about Riser. He, he was mistaken as a, as a prey guy, a, dog who, a guy who liked dogs that played their way through work instead of were deadly serious. Um, these guys, this is before the positive revo uh, reinforcement revolution. This is before a lot of the stuff that we know now. These guys trained with pressure. They made use of stress. They exploited stress. 
They were very, very hard on their dogs. So it's a way that almost nobody train dog, trains dogs anymore. But the influence of the theoretical model is very, very strong. Uh, okay, Chris, what do you want me to do? Keep going on the next guy? Yeah, keep going on the next guy. As long as I keep connection, and then we'll stay in here for a little bit, then we'll see like what we're okay. recording. We'll, we'll edit stuff later, you know what I mean? Okay, all right, sounds good. Um, so the next guy who, who actually was a mentor, and the way he wound up being a mentor is I got hired to write his, his videos, to write the scripts for his videos. I've written the script, I wrote the, wrote the script for Dildai's videos, Balabanov's videos. It's just because some dog trainers out there with tremendous talent and, and kind of depth of feeling and thinking just don't have writing skills and system, systematizing skills. So they need somebody like me to understand their method and then go in and work out their didactics, how, their didactics, how they get the uh, ideas across, how they get the, the uh, methods across. So I got hired to uh, do the videos for Gildai, first time I'd ever met him. And he actually wound up, like almost nobody knows his name these days, I don't think. Um, but this was in the very infancy of positive reinforcement training and work dogs. People in AKC obedience, and, and this is before agility, all that stuff, People in AKC obedience, there were some of those who trained with positive reinforcement, you know, operant conditioning, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But almost th that was almost unknown in working dogs, almost unknown. And so uh, Dildai was one of the first proponents who had great success. Like uh, a couple of his students won the WUSV championships and, and all kinds of stuff like that. And the thing about Dildai was that he had two or three completely original ideas. I mean, mind-blowing ideas. And if, if you're trying to make a contribution to a field and when your ass is dead, you want your influence to remain, what you want to do is come up with original ideas. And to have two or three of them all at once is really rare. And Dilda had two or three really original and important ideas. Damn, my phone's ringing. Wait, we still there, Chris? Oh, we're still here. Okay, good. So, so Dildai had two or three completely original ideas. One of them was the primacy of positive reinforcement, that what we should do is we should train the dog in a low stress state with moderate motivation using food. The next one was a really, really powerful insight. Uh, Gottfried's system was completely integrated around the idea of reducing conflict in the dog. And that conflict came in two flavors. One flavor was conflict between handler and dog, right? And another aspect of conflict was conflict in the dog's mind, we'll call it, between opposing impulses. So a, a dog in a dog who's really afraid and he's so afraid he might bite you and he moves at you and moves away and moves at you, that's a dog showing conflict between his fear and his desire to bite to make the situation uh, resolve itself, right? And so uh, a lot of what Dildai did was directed towards reducing conflict and all this other kind of stuff. And it was really powerful and super original. So for instance, Dildai would give a dog a bite in the, sl a bite in the blind after barking, turn you, and now the guy taught really boring seminars, right? This shit was not entertaining and it moved really, really slow. So he would, and he's this kind of big, kind of ape-like, strongly built guy um, and kind of slow in his movements, right? Like an old tired farmer. And he, sp he spoke slowly, everything with, with Gottfried happened sm slowly. So, um, so Dilda would give a dog a bite, a young dog who hasn't done the work before, give the dog a bite, have the handler withdraw and stand with the dog, holding the sleeve, and then Dildai would like light a pipe, <laughs> you know, smoke on it for a few minutes. And after a while, the dog would get bored or whatever and drop the sleeve. And the instant he dropped the sleeve, the work would start again. And, and um, okay. Dildai would wait as long as he needed to. So it was a way of producing the transition to a next exercise without conflict, because conflict changes the dog's mood. Sometimes if you induce conflict, it makes the dog more powerful in a stressy kind of way. And sometimes it makes the dog weaker. Well, Dilda I drove with the idea of making the dog as strong as possible by putting him in a no conflict state, right? And I'd never seen anybody do anything like this. And it was really powerful and really original. And not many people are, you know, kind of brave enough to, 
to do stuff like that and build I was. So he had a big influence on me and I, I hope a lot of other people who are working in a low conflict kind of uh, orientation, I hope they, they were influenced by Gottfried too because his, his influence is important. Uh, there's a set of videos about Gottfried Dildai distributed by Canine Training Systems. Um, they're probably all online now, but you can go to Canine Training Systems to look up Gottfried Dildai stuff. And I wrote the scripts and the scripts are really elaborate, uh, almost like short books. And so they really get a lot of information across with some good video and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I haven't seen a lot of his stuff, uh, but I'm definitely, I've definitely been on Canine Training Systems before. He's really old fashioned now. So we're talking, I, I think I did the videos in the early 90s and things have moved at such a pace in the last 20 or 30 years that the 90s is ancient history now, right? Yeah. Um, okay, next person to talk about is Ivan Balabanov. I, uh, I call him Ivan because I think that's where, not Ivan, because I think that's the way the name is pronounced. And I make a guess at Balabanov. Most people call him Balab Balabanov. I don't know which one yeah. is, is correct. So, so Balabanov, I think he's originally a Romanian who moved to uh, Western Europe, actually worked in Belgian ring clubs, you know, as a sport guy, as a hobbyist, and then made the jump to America, where he, like Riser, has helped to change everything. Now, I call him a mad genius, right? Because the guy, the guy is a genius. But he, he's also, he's kind of difficult to learn from because his, his thoughts are really elliptical and his, his teaching method is kind of elliptical. And he's not real concerned about making you happy with him in his seminar, right? He presents the information and you get it or you don't get it. It's as simple as that. So, so you know, he's, so he's not an entertainer, right? And he's this big, tall guy, like thinner than me. He's got this funny, reedy little voice. And, and still a strong accent. And he says, he says the most penetrating things about dogs. And so this is one of the guys who, who worked for the first time in working dogs in the behavior marking tradition or orientation. What I mean by that, everybody should know, is a system of communication between the handler and the dog where the handler can mark a behavior as to be followed by something else, mark a behavior to be, to be followed by reward or mark a behavior to be followed by punishment and identify for the dog the causal link between its behavior and what happens to it next. And in the DOD context, we're talking about the use of the word yes, use of the word no, use of the word good, you know, all that kind of stuff. Though good is not praising the dog, it's an item of information is what it is. It's a unit of information. Balabanov was one of the first guys to work out an entire system, and certainly the most prominent person working in America, to work out an entire system using behavior marking, uh, relying to a great extent on positive reinforcement and stuff like that. Now, in one of the really, really penetrating things he said to me that has influenced me ever since is I was interviewing him to write his scripts, right? And um, I asked him at one point, we were talking about some exercise, and, and uh, Yvonne said, if the dog doesn't do it, you say no, then you correct, and then you go on. But the thing is, it was, it was like forced retrieve or something. You're like really close to the dog. So in principle, you don't need a marker for the uh, adverse event that happens, for the aversive event. If you're, if you're punishing with a choke chain or a pinch collar or something like that, you can do it right on top of the behavior so it's paired in time with the behavior. So in a way, saying no isn't necessary. And so playing devil, devil's advocate, I said, Yvonne, wh why do you bother to say no? Why don't you just correct the dog? And he acted like that nobody had asked him that question before. And he thought kind of deeply for a minute. And then he said, I, I don't ever want anything to happen to the dog that is not signaled to him beforehand. Nothing important should ever happen to the dog as a surprise to him. It always should be signaled. And, um, and where he went from that, and I, I, could, I could detect this from, from his training, is, is he would have dogs that if he said no, the correction that followed the no, if he used the correction, was just a little chink on the pinch collar. Just a little chink. And the dog would act like, oh, man, I'm a bad dog. That, real, oh, that was awful. That sucked. I never want that to happen again. This same dog, in a context of bite work or stimulated obedience or whatever, you could hammer on the dog, absolutely hammer on the dog. 
And because you hadn't, and all it would do is give him spirit, right? And because you hadn't preceded it and predicted it with no, the dog interpreted it differently. It's not painful. It's not bad. It's stimulating, right? So sure. that was among many other important ideas. That was that was really that was really influential to me, and I still try to work in that tradition. Like, uh, I only surprise the dog when that's really what I deliberately mean to do. And that's the point of the whole thing. The rest of the time, I'm always making sure that the dog knows what's going to happen later. He knows when he's going to get the ball. He knows when he's going to be punished. He knows when he's going to get food. He knows when he's going to get a pat on the head. Right. Everything is known to him on the basis of the system of signals between handler and trainer. Um, so you real quick though, go ahead. Ivan was the first person you ever saw use verbal cues prior to any physical things going on. Essentially the beginning of marker training and, and it's practical application. I wouldn't necessarily credit him with it. Um, I, think <laughs> other, I, I think other people out there were doing it. I think Michael Ellis who trained with Yvonne back in the beginning was doing it. So I wouldn't necessarily say he invented this stuff, but what I would say is he was a very, very early adopter. He was super creative and came up with theory and method that worked around this method. And he had great influence because he did very well in international competition. So people, people lined up to go to his seminars, to watch the videos we did, the whole deal. So I'm not saying he was the first, he was the best. I'm saying he wound up being the most important because you guys can still go online, um, go to Canine oh, yeah. Training Systems again, and see the Yvonne Bilab Bilabinov uh, videos. It's, it's powerful stuff. Um, yeah, those were some of the first ones I watched. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's kind of funny, it, it, during the Dildai videos, um, I needed bad examples, right? Like I needed examples of dogs biting with, with partial mouths, dogs looking all stressy, all that kind of stuff. And I had this big library of video that we had uh, developed during making my videos and some other people's videos. And so anytime I needed a video of a dog doing not what we want uh, in the deal that video, I would drop in some of this video that often featured me as, uh, as a dog trainer, right? As the, as the edge tear. And what people, well, people came to me, people came to me later and said, oh, Stuart, you got to know, you know, those dildai videos are interesting. They're really good, but man, he's trashing you. You're, you're, you're on there and he's saying what you're doing is wrong and your dogs look like shit. And I, I didn't know what to say. I didn't understand the distinction between, you know, creating, creating a teaching instrument and kind of advertising and representing a method, right? They didn't realize I'd written the videos. You thought, anyway, anyway, that's kind of my, that's kind of my deal. The, 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 the work of a script writer is not, not greatly appreciated. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So the next guy that I would mention as, as a strong and important influence is Michael Ellis. And, and before I uh, did this interview with you, I sat down to write some notes and what I wrote about Michael was this. One of the best dog men in the costume, meaning the bite suit, at the end of a leash when training a dog, or in front of a class in the U.S. and in the world. Michael is almost without peer. He is the most lucid, clearest, most creative speaker in dog training that I know of, and he's a brilliant analyst and a brilliant technician of training. Uh, and he has like a large body of videos out there uh, that one can learn from. So. Michael, Michael Ellis is the shit, right? Absolutely the shit. Um, he's also a real cool guy, but the, the thing that really distinguishes him in, in addition to his talent and his technical ability is he's a super clear, incisive speaker. He doesn't use fancy words like I do normally. He communicates a little more simply, and he just has a gift for making things clear. It's, it's, it's really great. It's really remarkable. It's um, beautiful to watch. Okay, so, and, and wonderful to watch. Uh, no, I, nobody produces more impressive work from dogs than, than Michael does. Um, okay, next one is a guy named Dave Croyer. And Croyer, I know, has a reputation. He has a, a small kennel outside of Hutto, Texas. And I, I met up with him in a kind of, a kind of an accidental way. But the deal with Croyer, Croyer is still very active. He's still teaching. 
He's still competing on a regular basis in international trials and clocking up high scores. And this is, this is what one needs to look at when you're looking for instructors and teachers. It's not the guy who won the championship last year that you need to learn from. It's the guy who got third last year and fifth the year before and eighth year, the year before and third the year before with different dogs coming all the time with different dogs and bringing them to very, very high levels of, of performance. Well, that's the kind of guy that Croyer is. He is, he is taking a lot of dogs to, uh, to high level international trials and, and shown impressive stuff. Not always the winner, but, but shown very impressive stuff. Um, and he is one, only, one of the only work dog people right now that's trained, that trains working dogs with a, a sort of a complete free shaping and successive approximation system. So he takes a young dog or a new dog into his, into his training room and he doesn't give commands. He doesn't tell what the dog what to do. He lets the dog hang out until the dog begins to generate behavior. And then Croyer starts telling the dog which behaviors will be reinforced and which ones won't. And, and he, on that basis, he teaches dogs all of the skills in Schutzhund sport, what's now called IGP sport, right? So yes. the dog, a dog that will only have had positive reinforcement with food will do all the exercises in obedience, right? Uh, now it has to be a slightly low distraction environment, stuff like that, but he'll teach a young dog to do all this stuff. And then later on, he begins to influence the dog's behavior with aversives. And, and he's a technician of absolute genius, right? And um, one of the interesting things I got from him is, is I was taught to train dogs through my relationship with the dogs, which basically involved kicking their ass, right? Like when I was a kid, I got taught to kick, how to kick a dog's ass. And that, that was, and that, that legacy is something that's been hard to escape from and hard to get out of. <laughs> and, um, and so, uh, 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 let me see, I forgot where I was I'm talking about Croyer and you're talking about kicking ass. Yeah. Kicking ass. Oh yeah. That was what you're talking so about. We used to, so, shaping, yeah. so we used to train dogs through, through our, the relationship, you use the relationship of dominance over the dog and all that kind of stuff. That's how you train them. Right. And, and Croyer, and this new generation of work dog guys who, who work in a pretty strict, at least part of the time, in a pretty strict uh, positive reinforcement uh, setting, um, they, they, don't, they don't work through the relationship. It's, you know, it's like a business relationship. I do this and you give me food reliably, right? And um, so uh, the interesting thing about that is not only does it, it not rely on the relationship, but sometimes it doesn't affect the relationship, right? Like I used to get the dog, my relationship with the dog where I wanted it in the course of training the dog. Croyer trains the dog and then, oh yeah, by the way, at some point he tells the dog, I'm master, right? At some point he does the, he does the relationship work so that the dog becomes reliable and will work in any context and stuff like that. And, that, and, and in, in my day, there was no distinction. Now there's a very clear distinction between some people between teaching the dog the exercises and teaching him fluency uh, and, and gaining very strong influence with him so that he, he behaves according to command in any circumstance and consistently and all that kind of stuff. Um, so as I said, Dave's still teaching. He's got stuff all over the internet. Really, really valuable guy to listen to. Also has a really elegant method for training detection in a food reinforcement uh, framework that influenced the work of the breeding program quite a lot for teaching, uh, for teaching final response. And this system is kind of the new tradition of don't teach the dog to search first, teach the dog to, to respond first, then teach him he's gonna have to search for the thing that he's gonna respond to, right? So, so Croyer has a very, very interesting and well-integrated system for doing this work. Um, yeah, I put out quite a bit of information because his, um his DVD series that he has regarding detection. There's not a lot of detection DVDs out there, especially like more recent ones or more recent mm -hmm. modern, modern methods. His is brilliant. I really love it. Yeah. Uh, no, Croyer's, Croyer's the shit. Very, very important guy. And he's not winning all the world championships, but he competes again and again at a high level with dogs in ring sport and IGP and the whole deal. And he is a solid citizen. Um, 
Okay, last guy I'd like to discuss who, who had a big influence on me and still available to influence you guys if you want to be influenced is a guy named Mike Suttle. Uh, Mike Suttle has a business he called Lo calls Logan House. I can't remember if it's in, I don't know, it's South Carolina or I don't know. Uh, anyway, I can't, I can't remember where his place is, but he breeds dogs and a lot of his living comes from breeding Malinois of k &PB background and selling them to police, selling them to special forces, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so Subtle, very interesting guy, really penetrating uh, thinker, very lucid, clear speaker. So like Ellis, he's very easy to learn from. He gives a great seminar, right? With many, many important points. And if there's stuff that you knew that you already know, he expresses it in a way that helps you make it more clear and put it in that yeah. relationship with all the stuff that you know, right? So yeah. and then he'll come up with some totally new ideas too. So, um, and he's also one of the pioneers in training really hard dogs with positive reinforcement method, methods because Croyer likes top tier dogs. He likes, he likes special forces kinds of dogs and stuff like that that are really powerful animals, not a joke. And, uh, and, and Subtle was one of the first guys to approach those dogs in a positive reinforcement framework. He's also an, a superb technician of drive building and development in puppies. Uh, he, he does some of the best work I have ever seen. And he's also uh, quite a reputable breeder, quite a reputable breeder. So I recommend you look up Subtle if you can as well. Go to his seminars. He does chicken clicking seminars where he shows up with a trailer full of chickens and start yep. showing you how to train, you know, condition chickens to do stuff with, with a clicker. And then he shows you how to do it with little bitty puppies and he does detection and the whole deal. He does very, very interesting work. So I recommend him strongly. Um, if you guys can't find any information on any of these people, um, I have a lot of their streams, DVDs, books, papers written by them, um, which I'll post those things later. But, uh, yeah, almost every single person on this list, except a couple of the very beginning ones that are, you know, were alive before I was even born. But um, awesome. That's, that's an extreme list of mentors right there, man. Uh, another, another guy I'd mention, um, just because I think he, he does remarkably good work, and he's a really solid citizen in a practical working dog realm, and also a friend of mine for like 40 years, is a guy named Kevin Sheldahl. Kevin recently retired from the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Department, but he has for many years handled a work dog on the street, uh, run classes every year to train other cop, completely raw green cops with completely raw green police dogs. And after a period of just a few weeks, you see dogs with a high level of technical ability. He, I don't know how he does it. It's absolutely amazing. And I have a story. How do you spell his last name? Uh, Sheldahl, S-H-E-L-D-A-H-L. -H -L. Okay, okay, okay. The, the only way to get exposure to him is to go to his classes. I think he also teaches the occasional seminar. I don't think he has videos. I don't think he, he has a book and that kind of stuff. But, but he's, he's a real deal. He's a German shepherd man. As long as I've known him, when all the other cops are going to, to Malinois, Kevin would import every few years from Europe for himself a first-class German Shepherd dog and then use that dog on the street. Um, he also is quite capable of training an IGP dog to a V rating and he's done it many, many times. So he's, he's one of those complete trainers. He can do sport and work for points and he also works dogs at night in, in rough situations and gets it done. And, um, and he's, he's quite expert with uh, electric collar. Now, he's a completely practical police dog trainer, right? Like, Kevin is not out to impress you. He's not out to show you how fancy what he does is. He's only out to get it done. And the, 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 the degree to which he can get it done is astonishing to me. The guy's a really, really good instructor. And um, my, my best story about Kevin Sheldahl, or, or one that was very kind of influential on me, was I taught a police dog seminar in New Mexico. And, uh, and at the time, the thrust in police dogs, this is back when, when you took a dog to a building, you started to try to talk to somebody in the building, your dog went ape shit with barking. And then when you're ready, you open the door, you turn your, loose, your dog loose and he runs in the back of the building, right? 
And if you find somebody, then you're going to have to go in after him and go figure out what he's got. Um, in, in this era, people were realizing the error of their ways, right? They were realizing it's not safe to have your dog disappear in the back of a building you're searching. You need to have tactical control of your dog, use tactical skills and thinking and all that kind of stuff. And your dog is there to make you more safe instead of less safe. Because there are very few things as unsafe as diving into uh, an, a situation with unknown threats and you're in a hurry and you feel a great sense of, uh, of imperativeness because your dog is in the building someplace with something unknown and you got to get to him. That'll make you do a lot of really risky stuff. So there was, um, there, there was a kind of a new awareness that a good police dog wasn't just an ass eater. A good police dog was trained at a high level, high technical level, and that the officer had excellent control of the dog. Um, and so I was just I was just putting out this 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 message, right? I, it wasn't my message; it was other people's message. But it grabbed me, and I got onto it, and I started to to base my police dog seminars around it. And so I go to New Mexico to train this police dog seminar, and there's a bunch of cops I never met there, you know, big old corn-fed kind of guys with their police dogs. None of them have shit to say, right? So you can ask for questions, no questions. These guys just look at you, right? I'm thinking to myself, oh, God, I got another one of these seminars. They're brought their dogs, you know, half of the dogs won't bite. The, the half that does bite won't have an out. Oh, man, I'm in for a long five days, right? Yeah. So, so I give them a big talk about the necessity of having control of your dog, right? Like I'm, I'm trying to proselytize them. I'm trying to show them religion and they don't have any. So then we go out to do the first practical work. And I, I ask this guy to send his dog. The dog bites me. A uh, little bit of stuff goes on. And then I nod my head at the dog, at the guy to come get his dog or do whatever he's going to do. And he recalls the dog to him. Like, boom, back to heel. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that, that was interesting. And I said, okay, send him again. And can you leave him with me this time? Dog comes down, bites the crap out of me. I nod my head. The dog outs, withdraws about 15 feet, lies down and guards me. And I'm like, oh, even more interesting. Then I say, okay, do you have a stop to tack on this dog? He says, yeah, yeah, if you mean a call off, that's what I got. And I said, okay. And he's actually, uh, uh, well, I'll get to that part in a second. So I said, okay, let's see it. Guy sends his really strong dog down the field to me tells him down, the dog folds his leg up in motion, folds his legs up, hits the ground on his, on his elbows and chest, skids about 10 feet and stops, staring at me, guarding me, right? Halfway between me and the, uh, the handler. And I was like, wow, that's pretty wild. That's a nice stopped attack. That's a nice down and root. And then the guy said, well, that's one that he knows. There's others. And I said, well, show me one of the others. And he <laughs> He had, he had down in root. He had uh, out and return. He had out and return. And this is something I still do with police dogs. Like you, you teach the dog to come away from the decoy, whirl around and lie back down and guard. And, yeah. and you tell him with your voice how far you want him to come. So this would be the way that you would extract somebody from a building you know, in, in a tactically uh, best practices manner, right? So you, your dog has detained the guy either bitten him or got him behind a, a door or something like that. You recall the dog 10 feet to uh, 15 feet to you. When he comes 15 feet, you down him. He whirls around and lies down. You tell the guy to advance, advance to the dog. He does. Then you call your dog back another 15 feet. The dog, you tell the guy to follow the dog. And that's how you bring the dog back to you along with the guy in a completely controlled manner without having to poke your nose into a situation that you haven't necessarily kind of threat assessed and, and made safe. Huh. Um, so, and, and, and they were all like this, like there were like six police dogs at this seminar. It was a small seminar. They were all trained like this. And I was like, holy shit. I, you know, I'm here to, I'm here to teach you guys to train dogs and I can't train dogs this well. And I said, <laughs> and I finally just kind of got disgusted and like threw down the sleeve and said, okay, who taught you guys? And I said, oh, Kevin Sheldahl. <laughs> so so Kevin's, Kevin's an important resource too. Um, Man, I'd love to get in contact with this guy. Uh, yeah, I can, I can give you his contact. I know he's done a couple of gigs for military. He did a teaching gig at Lackland for us. 
Um, he's, he's the real deal. He's, he's kind of semi-retired now, but I know he's, he's teaching a police dog class, one of his several week patrol or detection classes in uh, New Mexico right now. They sent me an email because he's got a breeding program dog in his class. Um, okay, so, so that's pretty much, that's a long answer to the question, but those are, those are influences, those are mentors. I hope it's a valuable list. Oh, awesome list. Let's uh, pause the recording. You want to do that to see sure. if it actually recorded? Yeah, I'll kill myself if it didn't. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we are recording. Okay, brilliant. So carry on. Okay, so. How's, how's my about... hair? Is my hair good? <laughs> oh, I, mean, nice I know it's bad. I didn't take a shower oh, or nothing. I'm just here. And, and incidentally, <laughs> and you're not going to find out whether or not I'm wearing pants. You can just wonder. Right. I put all oh, that. Yeah, That's all I do. <laughs> Matter of fact, I, I got a story for you that may entertain people. Uh, years ago at Lackland Air Force Base, we had, uh, we had an officer who was commander of ops for a while, and he had a reputation for great eccentricity. So at one point, a friend of mine went in for a vicious counseling because he'd done something unacceptable, right? So he gets dressed up in his most crisp uniform, polishes his boots, all that kind of stuff, goes and sits there in the, in the guy's outer office, kind of nervous, right? Um, finally gets told to go into the office. And, and the guy's an E7 at the time, right? So he's not a, not a junior NCO. He has some experience, has some knowledge, goes and sits down in, in the guy's office, the, the officer sitting there, officer's got, you know, nice crisp uniform on his rank, the whole deal. He's looking good. They start the counseling. My buddy gets counseled like rigorously, right? And then the officer pushes the piece of paper over to him and says, you know, please sign here. And, uh, and he says, oh, okay, uh, can I borrow a pen, please? And the officer looks around for the pen, pulls open his drawer, can't find one, says, excuse me. And he stands up and walks over to another piece of furniture to get a pen, and he's not wearing pants. <laughs> There's no way that is true. <laughs> truth, truth, man. He's not wearing pants. It's boxers. And, oh, and, my gosh. And my buddy was like, <laughs> oh, man. You could do that. Easy. They put a report on you. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, go ahead. Question. Okay, so moving on past mentors. Um, so there's been a slight change in the training realm, like where we've gone, where we've been, stuff like that. Talk a little bit about CST, what, what we're kind of using and where you would like things to go or what you have seen been changed in the past, you know, from the 1980s till 2020. Okay, well, 1980s to 2020 <laughs> is a huge topic. So I'll just kind of cut it down to... Uh, not that I don't want to talk about it. It's just we lack, we lack the time. Um, sure. I'll just kind of cut it down to DOD history. And what I would say is that I wound up in a position of influence as the um, chief of the military working dog course. And everyone knew I was a dog trainer. And we needed to get a little bit better results in training. And so I began introducing new methods. Now, I didn't originate the methods. These are just methods that I learned from other people, like some of the people that I've, I've discussed to you guys. Um, one of those was DFR, Deferred Final Response Training. And, and that was kind of a step in the modern direction. Most of the people doing really, really progressive uh, detection training now, they turn it on its head. They turn it absolutely backward. We taught dogs to search. We taught dogs to recognize odor. Then we tried to teach final response. In a, in, in a DFR setting with a really drivey dog, that, that could be difficult, right? Well, sure. what, what really contemporary modern detect, detector trainers often do is they teach final response first in the course of teaching final response, and then they teach odor recognition. And then finally, they teach the dog, hey, you're going to have to walk over 10 feet to find the thing you're going to respond to. Oh, hey, now the thing you're going to respond to is behind something else. So you got to go behind it and look for it. Finally, the thing you're going to find and respond to is invisible, and you got to search for it with your nose, right? Yeah, and yeah. So, so DFR was kind of a move in that direction, um, and it was very useful because it produced 
really intense search on the dogs and really, really high levels of independence. So a really good DFR dog is, the, 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 the strong part of the dog is that the dog is very, very independent and you can't make him false respond. You, can't, you, know, you, you as the handler uh, can't make him do stuff. The weak part of the dog is you can't make him do stuff, right? Uh, a sure. real strong DFR dog is difficult to influence while he's searching. Um, but if you asked me, I think people have all kinds of different uh, opinions, but if you asked me, DFR, you know, wasn't a perfect system, but it was a really important step forward to, to modernize us and, and get us in the direction that we need to, that we need to move. We as, as DOD, the DOD MWD community. Um, the next thing we, we introduced sometime later was, was clear signals training. And this was directly as a result of working with Yvonne and having exposure to Michael Ellis and stuff like that. So basically, CST is, is dumbed down Balabanov and Ellis, not done as well as they can do it, right? Um, gotcha. But, but that's what it is. And, and hopefully what we did is we, thank you. Um, hopefully what we did is we ruggedized it, you know, made it hard to break, uh, made it hard to get really bad results, all that kind of stuff. For and I am really, I mean, DOD can discourage you, right? Like DOD can wear you down after a few years, um, and so sometimes I kind of I get discouraged. I think to myself, you know, what difference have I made? You know, how, how have I made things better? And every now and again, I'll be driving through the training areas at Lackland, and I'll see some troop I don't even know, right? I don't even know the guy's name, and he's doing great obedience. <laughs> right? The dog's got his head up. He's got his tail up. He's fluent, relaxed. He's powerful and energetic. He understands the skill. And I'll just stop to watch that for a while. I will stop to watch that shit because, because I think that's the, the single biggest marker of the progress we've made in the last 20 years. And so it, it's now normal for DOD guys to not escape dogs into obedience skills but to use positive reinforcement to teach them, then layer over aversives to gain, you know, complete control of them, and and to have powerful active dogs. It's 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 kind of normal, and that's a huge step forward and influences everything else that we do. Um, I I never I never had much of an effect on the way dogs were patrol trained, partly because we never uh, like. Uh, canonized it. We never did a video or did a paper or anything like that. But there's a guy at a military working dog course now named uh, Master Sergeant Am Angel Landro. And, and Angel, actually, he's another person I'd mentioned as, as a mentor and an influence because Angel is brilliant. Angel does absolutely brilliant work. And, it's, and he works on such a subtle level of understanding dogs. Like you have to know or not and a, a lot just to be able to understand what he's doing right and yeah. you still might have to ask him questions he's he's crazy creative creative and he's also really courageous in the sense that you know he's never scared to make a mistake he's never scared to do something that may or may not work with the dog to see what the effect is and test it out he, he's totally he, he's not hung up on that right he just he just wants to learn more so he actually is extremely influential right now because he's the you know senior NCO in MWDC military working dog course has been there a long time and he's really really good and his heart's in the right place and he teaches well and all that kind of stuff and um, he is very influential right now on how biting dogs are trained in in MWDC and there's a lot less emphasis on force so Angel is is very adept at figuring out quote unquote operant ways, positive reinforcement ways of getting dogs to behave even in bite work. Um, so so that, that isn't my accomplishment, that's more Angel's accomplishment, but that's another big step forward for us. Beautifully said. And uh, who knows where we're gonna be in the next 10 to 20 years. You'll be retired, I hope. But yeah, we, we won't be here. We'll be in a very interesting place. This is a this is a really exciting time to be a dog trainer because important changes are happening faster now than ever happened at any point in my career in the last 40 years. Yeah, especially with like interviews and stuff like this where it's just <laughs> widespread information. <laughs> yeah, okay, the, so. the info thing is important because we used to have to drive halfway across the country to go to a seminar to learn and you don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. Um, 
So I want to talk a little bit about the operant conditioning question. If you wouldn't mind, do you have the question right there with you? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, Everyone's basically already seen it, but. Okay. So uh, I, I'm not exactly going to answer the question as it's written. I'm just going to kind of uh, dilate on the subject of operant conditioning. And okay. the first thing is to understand what we, what we invoke when we use the expression operant conditioning. First of all, you're discussing all of dog training, right? Like if you're out there, it doesn't matter if you even know the word operant. It doesn't matter if you've never been educated by anybody about using food or whatever. You're still using the neurological apparatus that evolution gave animals to adapt to their, their immediate circumstances, right? And, and, and that covers all four quadrants of the contingency square, like positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment. That covers pretty much all that we do in dog training, whether we're doing good dog training or whether we're doing bad dog training, right? So everybody uses operant conditioning. Um, the, the next thing is what we invoke by using operant conditioning instead of another expression. Operant conditioning is, is a term coined by B.F. Skinner uh, the term before B.F. Skinner for, for uh, voluntary responding modified by its consequences was instrumental conditioning, right, from Thorndike. And then uh, Skinner, who was, he was kind of, how to put it, he wanted to be an authority, he wanted to change the world, and part of that is, is giving new names to things, right, to kind of claim them as your own and get your... Sure. Get your, get your own influence. And so he took instrumental conditioning, pulled out what he thought were the really important points and called it operant conditioning. And operant covers the kind of context in which the animals behaved. It also covers a bias. The bias is a bias towards positive reinforcement because B.F. Skinner was a radical behaviorist and his belief was punishment doesn't work. Don't punish animals, don't punish children, it doesn't work. Well, that's bullshit, right? But punishment can work very, very well, which is why, for instance, I follow the speed limit most of the time and you know all that kind of stuff. <laughs> punishment works super, super well. Now, of course, many of us really mess it up in dog training, but it's, it's a really important way in which animals, including dogs, adapt to their immediate circumstances and dog trainers can make use of it. Well, when you say operant conditioning, you're kind of kicking all that to the curb. Most of the people who talk about operant conditioning, they're positive reinforcement oriented. Many of them have a strong value judgment about whether or not it's okay to use aversive control, whether it's okay to make an animal do something and, and so forth. So I tend to use the word instrumental conditioning instead of operant conditioning. It means fundamentally the same thing, but kind of without the, the theoretical bias, right? And, gotcha. uh, but still, we got positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment, the whole deal. It's all there. Now, we haven't talked about Pavlovian. Um, if you, I said operant conditioning covers all, covers all of training. Well, in, in the case of Pavlovian, it, it covers most of Pavlovian too, because if you think about it, we do relatively few strict Pavlovian procedures. And for the viewers, if you guys recall, the, the critical association in instrumental conditioning is between a response and an outcome, right? Between a behavior on the dog's part and an environmental event that takes place. The critical uh, association in a Pavlovian contingency is between two different stimuli, right? And if you think about it, and you don't, you don't try to control what the dog does, you just expose the animal to one stimulus and another stimulus, and you counter condition or do whatever you're going to do. Um, there are relatively few strict Pavlovian procedures we use. One of them is counter conditioning gunfire with, with the ball. That's pretty much straight Pavlovian. Uh, doesn't need operant or instrumental conditioning to explain it. Can be explained on the, in the course of, uh, it, by using Pavlovian conditioning theory. Uh, another one is, is teaching, uh, teaching recognition of odor. So very often the way we teach recognition of odor is we present odor, environmental stimulus, and immediately afterward we present a really strong goal or reward for the dog. That's a Pavlovian procedure. But 
pretty much, and, and what makes it Pavlovian is you're not trying to control what the dog does, right? You're not, the, the, the reward that you give the dog isn't a function of what he did. It just always comes after the first thing, right? Sure. And because of, and because of Pavlovian conditioning, that takes control of the animal's behavior and you start to see the conditioned products of the Pavlovian association. So, so the, the first part of it is, you know, don't think there's anything super special about operant conditioning. It's just a new kind of a buzzword that some people adopt because it kind of dovetails with their uh, theoretical perspective on dog training. I prefer to use instrumental because it's kind of more capacious and because I'm not a positive reinforcement Nazi, I think it's normal at a point in the dog's development to start using aversive control um, to, to get the result that we need. Um, and let me see. And remember that I, I kind of made this point implicitly, but I didn't make it explicit. I'll make it explicit now. Any instrumental procedure that you carry out with a dog, any instrumental conditioning procedure, will have embedded in it, in it a Pavlovian procedure, right? So let's say, um, let's say I'm using the command sit to get the dog to sit, and then I give him food, right? Well, I'm thinking about the association between sitting and getting food, but without thinking about it, I'm making a Pavlovian presentation. Uh, hi guys, what I'm gonna do here is interrupt myself to do a better job of explaining kind of an important issue than I did in the original interview. Uh, we were talking about the way that Pavlovian conditioning procedures are embedded in instrumental conditioning procedures. Uh, and my example for that was asking a dog, uh, teaching a dog to sit with food. Well, when you do that, you're, you're thinking about, oh, if he sits, I'll give him food. But if you're good at engineering the sit, what happens very reliably is after you face the dog, hold the food up and say sit, he gets fed. The, the presentation of the command followed by food, that's a Pavlovian presentation, right? So you're thinking about you're conducting an instrumental procedure, but without realizing it, you're also always conducting a Pavlovian procedure as well. That's great when the behavior that's generated by Pavlovian conditioning helps you in establishing the instrumental response you're after. And, and in this example of food, that's the case, right? So if, if the dog learns that me facing him, holding food up and asking him to sit is gonna result in food, what he's gonna do is activate and want to approach, want to sign track the food in my hand, move towards it. That makes him lift his head, often makes him put his, his rear end on the ground or near the ground, and I can reinforce that, right? So in this case, the food is conditioning, is teaching the dog the meaning of, the emotional meaning of being told to sit right? And it, if the emotional meaning is, oh, become open, become receptive, lift your head, approach your handler, then that's just going to help the sit. Okay, now back to the original video. Um, so when I do instrumental conditioning, I cannot avoid also doing Pavlovian conditioning because I'm presenting chains of stimuli, one stimulus, then another stimulus. Yes. Um, now, where that gets important is and that can be transparent to the trainer as long as the Pavlovian contingency, the kind of behavior it makes the dog show, is concordant with what the instrumental contingency is asking the dog to do. So when we use food to teach a dog to sit, uh, as a result of Pavlovian conditioning, the dog will start to orient, will start to sign track and approach the hand in which you hold the food. He'll lift his head. That'll tend to bring his rear ass end down. Um, so anything you teach the dog in this context, both the Pavlovian conditioning uh, uh, contingency and the instrumental conditioning, right? Pavlovian is after I say sit, you get fed. Instrumental is after you sit, if you sit, you get fed, right? Um, in this context, what the dog learns as a function of Pavlovian conditioning doesn't interfere with what you're trying to teach him as a function of instrumental conditioning. But that ain't always the case. So now let's go back to good old escape training right? Where you take a naive dog who doesn't know how to sit, you put a choke chain on him, and he's telling him to sit, and then you choke his ass into the sit. Well, again, what you're, what you're creating is a Pavlovian conditioning uh, uh, contingency between the word sit and the signals that you give when you want the dog to sit, and choking, right? And you get 
Pavlovian condition responding out of it. What would the Pavlovian conditioning be? Stiffening, stress, and aggression, right? Oh, yeah. So, so if we're teaching sit with food, we don't have to be thinking very much about the Pavlovian contingency because it'll just help what we're trying to do. If we're teaching something critical using aversive control, and a good trainer does this as little as possible, if we're teaching something critical using aversive control, the, what we want, what the dog learns to do from an instrumental conditioning standpoint may not map well onto what he learns to do from a Pavlovian thing, right? So you get a dog who, when you say sit, he freezes defensively, right? Or when you say sit, he bites your hand off, right? <laughs> sure. He, he anticipates you joking. him. So, so now let's talk about what the common faults are. Like where, where do we fail in applying instrumental conditioning? Now the, the core of instrumental conditioning is not net well, but the core is definitely that a response is followed by a, a consequence, right? But there's another part that characterizes most of the good train, dog training that's done today. And this is the new part, right? Like people, I was messing with positive reinforcement in the early eighties, um, but I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't get any real important done. Uh, later on, people came and they started to realize how to really train the dogs to understand and carry out movements and all that kind of stuff. And the big advantage they had that I didn't have is that at, at that time, 20 years later, the uh, exotic animal training tradition had begun to penetrate the dog training tradition, first through AKC and then in a roundabout way, police and sport. And in a funny kind of way, sport was... You know, it's police is the, the police training is the, the slowest to change in this direction, but sport was real uh, slow to change in that direction too. And the, what made it work is the stuff we've already talked about. Behavior marking, right? Response marking, communicating information to the dog in a set language so he knows instantly what the outcome of his behavior is going to be, right? Yes. So that's the core of it. So, so what most of us do is subsumed in, really described by two facts. One of them is that we're, we're conditioning the animal uh, to show behaviors more strongly or more often, or show behaviors less strongly and less often based on what happens as a consequence. And the other one is we're not waiting for the dog to find out what the consequence is. We're telling him instantly if he's done the right thing or the wrong thing, marking the behavior, and then, and then later on, we apply the reinforcer or the punishment. And I won't get into that, but some very, very interesting things happen there. Like, like reinforcement and punishment work completely different in a signaled uh, context than they do in an unsignaled context. So the thing, now, and here's the rub. There is a lot of technique involved in, yeah. in positive reinforcement work, right? And, and in particular, one of, the, one of the things that plagues everybody, I mean, you'll catch me doing this, right? Like you can, I have a pet dog here, I'm training for somebody, and you can come watch my training session and you'll catch me breaking the rule. Um, and what the rule is, is that the signal that you use to mark a behavior, it must precede the consequence, right? So if I'm gonna use a pinch collar, if, if say no and use a pinch collar, I don't do it like this. The dog misbehaves, I walk over to him, grab his collar and go, no, 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 right? That makes, that makes no just part of the punishment. There's no new information that comes with no. You might as well, you know, you're, you're wasting your breath. The way we should be doing things is by saying no in temporal contingency with, meaning immediately after something that the dog did, and then later on we can, we can punish or uh, omit positive reinforcement or whatever. Right. Yes. Um, the now there are a number of different kinds of behavior markers. The the kind of coolest and sexiest one is the terminal uh, release, which in a DOD context is the word yes. Other people use a clicker. You know, some of the exotic animal, exotic animal people use computer generated tones in the water and and whistles and all kinds of stuff. But basically, the terminal release is a marker that tells the dog not only, hey, what you just did was fully successful or what you just did was fully unsuccessful and you know what's gonna happen next. Um, 
and uh, and so it's a release, right? The animal stops behaving. If he's sitting and you say yes, and he's well-trained, he stops sitting and does whatever occurs to him, which is usually come to you for reinforcement, et cetera, et cetera. Where people go wrong, and this is me and everybody, this is why you have to have a mirror while you train or have a training partner who tells you what you're doing and so forth, is not only must you give the signal and then provide the consequence, but you have to make sure that you don't associate any other predictive cues with the yeah. So what I mean by that is if, if my positive reinforcement is a Kong I'm gonna take out of my pocket and the dog is right in front of me, he sits, here's my hand, he sits and I go, yes. My yes is not gonna be important to the dog, right? Because it doesn't give him added information. Dogs are, very, very uh, attuned to physical movements and gestures. So he is super disposed to be conditioned in a Pavlovian sense by the movement of my hand. So all I have to do is move my hand and the dog gets more excited. So if, if I move my hand at the same time that I say yes, the dog kind of neglects the yes. He doesn't pay attention to the yes, right? Sure. So what I have to do is say yes when he performs correctly. And this is the hard part refrain from doing anything else right don't move your hand don't move your head don't make your don't, don't make your your rain jacket make a noise you know none of that stuff there has to be a moment of nothing so that so that the word yes totally predicts for the dog what's going to happen next which is your hand moving and getting the the kong out and stuff like that that is the most common fault in this kind of work and it's so it, it's kind of like in football people say you know got to go back to basic tackling practice well yeah. it's fundamental but it ain't easy <laughs> which means you got to think about it all the time and you got to practice it all the time uh, that's the way behavior marking is 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 the the technique has to be clean um and you very often need somebody to be a policeman to help you be clean otherwise the dog the terminal release will not have the conditioning and the, the teaching power that it could have. So the question is, how do I tell if this particular handler's uh, terminal bridge, his terminal release, is fully conditioned, is conditioned the way that I think makes it the most effective tool? And that's a function of the dog's release. So very, very often, like if you're, if you're working with somebody and they're using the word yes, or they're using any kind of terminal marker. One thing that's very helpful is to do a little diagnostic test and say, okay, put your dog in a sit or put your dog in a down and just say yes. Don't move your head, don't move your hand, don't do it, just say yes. I don't even have a toy on you. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, and, and a dog that is very, very well trained will instantly release from whatever he's doing and show a ton of activity, like come over to you to get the ball, you know, all that kind of stuff. What you'll see very, very often, especially in people that you see them breaking that kind of rule of mark the dog, don't do anything else, now provide the consequence. If you see people breaking that rule and you wanna to show to them that they don't really have a release, they think they do, but they don't have a terminal bridge, is set this kind of thing up where you, they ha have them put their dog in a behavior, like make them look away from their dog or something, hold their arms still and say, yes. And if the dog keeps sitting, guess what? He has not learned the yes the way we need him to learn. Sure, yeah. In fact, funny story on that, when I was at Michael's school, there was a girl that had a really, really, really hard time reaching for food prior to her using the clicker. And for two weeks straight, every day, all day, he was so patient with this woman. I've never seen a more patient man. I, I was like, I was in a very soothing mode just going to his school and he would just correct her, say, no, that's incorrect. You, for two weeks straight all day long, by the, by the last day, she finally started to get it. I was just like, some people, it's hard to break those. Yeah, Michael, Michael's imperturbable, imperturbable. But it's, it's the most basic thing. It's the tackling of training based on instrumental conditioning. You got to do it right. You got to think about doing it right. And you have to have people help you to do it right. Um, okay, what's your next question?
You there, Chris? Uh oh. Are you back? Lost you for a second. Can't hear you. Hang on. Yeah. Okay, there we go. I think we lost signal for a little while. Yeah, it's me. It's always me. Trust me. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, let's let's go on to another question. Okay. Let's talk about genetics. Hold on. Okay. All right. Um, this seems to be a hot topic when I talk to everybody. Um, are we going to make an excuse to not train this? Can we actually fix this? How much of this is genetics? Um, what are we looking at during the selection process that we think um, isn't going to necessarily be trainable? Like it's largely predisposed by their genetics. Um, the pros and cons essentially too, when you're yeah. training you know, a dog that has amazing blood versus, you know, a dog that gets through it. I call him a buy one, get one half off dog, a BOGO dog. Yeah. Um, we buy the beast and then we get the other ones that are like threes and fours. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so let's see. Okay. The, the first thing to realize is that there are Bob Bailey is, is an interesting guy who's had a lot of influence on dog training in the last few years. And probably your, your, our viewers know who he is, so I won't go into it. But one of the things that he says in his seminars always is given enough time, anybody can train an animal to do anything uh, using any method, right? Now, okay. I think there's limitations to that because I've been totally unable to train a dog to do something before, no matter how hard I tried. But, but there's a principle there, which is in order to create something, you don't need the perfect method. You just need time and persistence and self-control, right? And in the same way, you don't need a perfect dog. And there are people out there who are such good technicians of training things like full bites that they can take a dog with no genetic predisposition to biting full, and they can make that dog fight, bite very, very full and steady, right? So there, there are people out there who can condition pretty bad dogs to look like really, really good dogs. Uh, and, and so that kind of gets you into the question of, okay, should I stick with this dog and keep training this to try to make him better? Or do I need a new dog? And that's, a, that's kind of a, in, in our agency kind of a setting, that's not a personal decision. That's an administrative decision. Um, yeah. uh, if you're working with your own dogs, it's a personal decision. So even though I know that given enough persistence and talent, I can, I can train a dog to do all kinds of stuff. Since I'm not a very good dog trainer and I have finite time and one of my faults is impatience and all kinds of stuff like that, for me, there's a certain cutoff where I won't mess with a dog. I, I will concede that it's possibly to be taught to do, to show the behavior we want, but I'm not gonna try to do it. I would prefer to get another dog that it's easier to get done with, right? And again, and we're often, in an agency sense, we're, we're often in that place. Like, so for instance, a dog that might be eliminated from training may be a super good animal and all he needs is another six months, but we don't have another six months. We don't want to use a year to get one dog. We want to use a year to get two dogs, right? Yeah. So, so in, in, an, in an administrative kind of agency sense, often the thing to do is to emphasize the quality of the dog to try to make sure that we get dogs that are at, at low risk of elimination and can be trained relatively easily without a ton of technical knowledge, right? Now, yeah. kind of overlapping that, let's talk about uh, character, basically. Character is an expression used by uh, primarily by Europeans to describe working dog behavior. So in the United States, if somebody wants to describe a dog's behavior, they'll use the word temperament. And temperament in Europe means something totally different. It means how lively and responsive the dog is. It doesn't refer to his courage or his nerves or any of that kind of stuff, right? The word character describes all of that stuff. So all, all the dogs out there can be classed in terms of their character. You have different ways of assigning different dogs to different classes and you know, all that kind of stuff. Basically, what I do 
is I class good dogs, meaning dogs that are useful. You can use them for work in, in three tiers. The first class dogs are top tier working animals. They're often suitable for breeding based on their character. They bite full automatically and they show many other behaviors just naturally based on their genetics. Um, second class dogs are dogs with flaws, with weak spots and sensitivities, but when properly handled and trained, they're still valuable dogs. Third class dogs are the ones that we can get the work done with, but all the time we wish we had a little more dog to work with, right? Yeah. So now let's go back. Does this mean we all need first class dogs? No, <laughs> it doesn't mean that. If I'm a breeder, which I am, I need first class dogs to breed from. But if I'm just a trainer working on the field, I, mean, I might be better off with a second class dog because first class dogs, first of all, it'll be easier to find a second class dog. It'll be cheaper to find a second class dog. And also a second class dog might be a hell of a lot easier to get along with than a first class dog because first class dogs are a pain in the ass, right? These are really, <laughs> really powerful dogs. And this is why I don't have breeding males at Lackland Air Force Base because I don't want some strong ass male dog in a, in a pen with not enough to do because after a couple of years, he's going to get dangerous, right? So, yeah. so the, the simple fact is most of us are going to work with what I call second class dogs because that's what's available. You know, that's what's there. And in some cases, we're better off with those dogs. Um, so, and, and if you ask me what, what's the goal of the breeding program, it's not produce 100% first class dogs because most people can't handle that kind of dog. They can't do useful work with that kind of dog. Yeah, um, yeah. Many, many more people can be successful with, I call, with what I call second class dogs. Now, the dog has to have some quality. The dog has to have some strong points. But it means that you find a weakness. When you evaluate the dog, you find a weakness that you need to work on. Not in terms of conditioning, like he doesn't sit quite correctly or something like that. But in terms of, okay, in civil aggression, when the decoy gets really close, the dog doesn't try to bite. He just lays back off the leash and waits for the guy to pick the sleeve up. Then he tries to bite, right? Or when the dog's biting, he tends to bite with a little bit of a noisy, uh, noisy, noisy bite and uh, shifting bite and all kinds of stuff like that. Now he's still biting you, right? We don't give a shit if the dog bites somebody, we don't give a shit if the dog bites pretty or not as long as he bites, right? So at a certain level, the cosmetics and the aesthetic uh, uh, value of the performance are not important. So, so what we have to do is pick dogs with the right kind of weaknesses. One of one of the test questions that I used to ask people when they were before boards for hiring a Lackland Air Force Base to be, to be trainers was I would ask them basically to choose for DOD between a dog that shows super strong civil aggressive behavior, like he's ready to tear your face off when you threaten him and shows yeah. every intent to bite when you get close, but he's a little stressy and nervous when he's on the bite that's your one dog you can choose. Or you can choose another dog who, when you civil agitate him, he sits at the end of the leash looking interested, but doesn't do a lot more than look interested. But when you break the sleeve out of the suit, he bites like a grizzly bear, right? Which of those dogs is, is most likely to succeed in our line of work as a patrol dog? Um, I think everybody has a different opinion. I've heard well-reasoned arguments on both sides. But my argument is we should take that first dog that dog that has a little weak spot in it, right? So when a dog shows, sometimes it's referred to as defense. I think of it just as aggression. But when the dog shows uh, expressive threat, what I mean by expressive threat is he shows his teeth, he barks, his, his hair bristles, his ears do a particular thing, his tail does a particular thing. Dogs that show that kind of expressive threat they're under stress and that's where the threat comes from, right? You can think of it like yeah. somebody, somebody talking shit real loud to somebody else because he's afraid of the guy and he's, he's trying not to let on that he is, right? And yeah. um, so, so that dog who is super, super strong civil and really impressive and threatening, he's expressing a little bit of weakness. It's important to understand that, right? Now, does that, and, and where will the weakness be expressed? 
The weakness will be expressed in you can break him. If you push him too hard, expose him to enough stress, you can break him, particularly if you do it cumulatively, right? Like you don't make every day a challenge for a biting dog. You know, every 10th day is a challenge for a biting dog to make him stronger. The days before that are teaching and, you know, feel good and all kinds of stuff like that. The, the other sense in which they're, um, they're more at risk is they tend to not bite as well because if a dog is under stress, he normally does not want to engulf because a, a prey bite is an engulfing and approaching bite. An aggressive bite is often a repelling bite, like boom, make you go away right? Sure. And so, and, and that can be expressed in a trained dog as a little bit of a partial bite or a bite turned a little to the side or a dog who crawls up your elbow or something like that. So that's the dog's weak point. He's totally ready to bite somebody, but I got to look out for his levels of stress. I got to make sure not to overstress him. And also I'm going to have some kind of technical, uh, some technical work to do to try to make the dog's mouth while biting as good as it possibly can be right? And also to make him feel in charge so he has the best stress resistance and all that kind of stuff. And what I've, if you ask me what the purpose of the breeding program is, so, so that's an example of a second class dog. It's a dog that you'd look at and go, I don't know if I want to breed puppies from that male because there's, there's a weak nerve in there and I'm afraid that in his puppies, the weak nerve will take over. So I don't necessarily want to breed with that dog. Now, will he make a good police dog? Oh, hell yes, he can make a good police dog. And some things will be easier with him. So if you take a strong civil dog, it's the technical problem of how to get the dog to bite somebody in civil, bite somebody for real on the street, is much simpler than if you have a dog who bites without stress, barks without stress, and bites full, right? Because those dogs are often, why? Because those dogs are often completely bonded to the equipment, right? They're after the equipment because they're thinking about biting. A dog who's strong, civil, aggressive is thinking about backing you off, changing your behavior. He threatens you, right? So, and, and those can be super, super useful dogs. I, I refer to those as soldier dogs. So if I produce a, a nice dog with, with a flaw, I send that dog to the field and he can be a soldier, meaning we don't want to produce more dogs with him, but he's going to be great as an asset right? Yeah. And, and in some people's hands, he'll do much, much, in, in a lot of people's hands, he'll do better than a first-class dog will, right? Because not, not many of us can work successfully with real powerhouse dogs that are hard, resilient, drivey, have aggression, the whole deal, right? That's, that, that's asking a lot in our system to have, give everybody one of those dogs. So that's why if you ask me, is, is the is the goal of the breeding program to produce 100% first class dogs? I go, no. The goal of the breeding program is to produce enough first class dogs to breed from, to produce scads of soldiers. Good, strong second class dogs that most handlers can succeed with and that are up to most of the challenges that they will encounter in service if they're properly taught. Which is mostly hunting anyways because it's mostly detection oriented for the most part. Yeah, it's mostly detective oriented. And if you think about it, uh, we years ago, we used to think of police patrol as the business of biting people. It's not. It's the business of finding people and controlling their behavior, right? Sure. So, yeah. so what patrol dogs do is they, they tell you where people are and they make first encounters so you don't. You don't have to because that's very, very risky. So the dog is a proxy for risk. The dog takes the risk for us, right? But his fundamental job is to search and let us know if somebody's there and to be completely under control and all that kind of stuff. And if you think about it, a good fox terrier can do 90% of the work that a good patrol dog does in terms of searching, barking to let you know somebody's there, all that kind of stuff, right? The issue of biting, that's something else and also, in some cases, it's not the important part of the work. The important part of the work is a dog telling you where somebody is and controlling this, helping you control the situation, right? Sure. Some good info right there. And yeah, like you said, there's a ton of different opinions on those two different types of dogs. Oh, yeah. You can, you can hear really smart people, smart, experienced people uh, create very good reasoning for each kind of dog. So I think subtle 
What Subtle would tell you is he doesn't want that strong civil dog because he's too concerned about that weakness. And, and what Subtle always says is, I don't care if the dog's happy when he bites you. I don't care if the dog is thinking about killing rabbits when he bites you instead of fighting a deadly enemy. I just care that he bites you, right? So I yeah. think Subtle's answer was, oh, so you got a dog with, with a naturally good mouth that bites hard and bites steady and doesn't show any stress. You get another dog that shows stress, is totally ready to bite now without additional preparation, but doesn't bite ideally. I think Subtle would take the first dog. Um, I think, well, here, let me, t let me tell you a story. This is a Kevin Sheldahl story. So, okay. um, so years ago, so, so Kevin had just started a police dog. We're talking eighties, right? Kevin had just started police dog training, uh, worked with a guy named Tom Brenneman and they started to import and sell some police dogs and stuff like that. And what, what Kevin told me, he, he may or may not be happy with me telling, telling this story. Uh, but what he told me was he got a dog in that had really goofy behavior, right? So for instance, when you sent him at the man, he'd run this big arc like this and then go to the man, right? What's that? That's ambivalence. That's conflict. That's the yeah. conflict between I'd really rather run away, but there are some reasons I want to bite you too. And that ambivalence is expressed in that, in that, uh, in that elliptical approach, right? Well, the dog was like that. He didn't bite very well. He was really growly and snarly and stuff like that. And so Kevin was, man, we're, you know, where can we place this dog where he'll be well used, right? So they finally, where he'll make the grade and be well used. So they finally like this, find this like rural police department where fuck all is going on, right? <laughs> Ain't nothing <laughs> happening out there. What, you know, what the police dogs do out there is search kids' lockers, you know, and walk in and help them break up drinking parties. That's, that's what the dogs do. So they, so, so Kevin sold the dog to uh, a department like this. So everything's going great. And like six months later, what happens, I'm trying to figure out whether to tell you about the, the phone call first or the incident. Um, okay. I'll tell you about the incident first. So they have, you know, what, what you often think about is some guy like some John Dillager running away across the country and happening upon some department that has a dog, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, even if you're not in Chicago, you might still encounter a criminal out of Chicago if you're working in a cornfield someplace. And so this is what happened. So they get a call. I can't remember what it was, like a, you know, a car chase, a guy trying to get away, he was escaped from prison, you know, all this kind of stuff. And the guy who handled this dog wound up in a textbook police dog deployment situation where he's sitting there with his dog on an open field with a guy running away. <laughs> and his dog is all keyed up on the guy and ready to go. It's like, oh, my God. And the guy doesn't comply, right? The guy doesn't stop running. He keeps going. So the guy cuts loose of the dog. The dog comes down the field after the guy, runs his big, weird elliptical deal, right? comes down the field, the guy sees the dog coming, the guy's a real tough guy. So he turns around, faces the dog off and goes like, I'll kick your ass. The dog, because he's not a very good dog, continues his button hook, goes behind the guy and bites the shit out of him on one of the cheeks of his ass, right? Oh, and the guy yes. goes, yeah! And he whirls <laughs> around at the dog. At which point the dog, because he's not a real good dog, lets go, backs up and starts to bay and circle the guy. Well, he's facing the dog. The dog's going around him. He's facing the dog. Meanwhile, the cops are approaching. That guy figures out, oh, shit, they're going to apprehend me. He tries to run. Dog bites him in the ass like a grizzly bear. The guy goes, yeah, turns around at the dog. Dog lets go and backs up, right? And, <laughs> and so the, the, entire, the entire impression produced was, wow, this is, this is not a good police patrol dog. This is an inferior product. This is a, class, a third class dog, right? Well, the phone call Kevin got was, was a congratulatory phone call from the police department saying, this animal is the best patrol dog ever. He is awesome. And incidentally, how did you teach him that kind of crazy jujitsu? <laughs> right? Like, like, <laughs> they thought it was purposeful. Did, yeah, how did he learn that kind of, that kind of uh, jujitsu? Because if you think about it, what your dog has to do is detain somebody. And if your dog will run over, and make somebody stop in, in, in a particular kind of deployment. 
if your dog will run over, make somebody stop and face them and make the guy afraid to get away, to try to get away, dog's doing his job. You don't care if he's a piece of shit or not, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, especially um, for the podunk towns. So, so that's kind of, that's kind of my, uh, uh, that's kind of my moral of the story where quality of dog is concerned. All of us pr uh, care, all of us prefer to work with dogs of high quality, but all of us have of really high quality, right? But, but all of us are forced to work with dogs that, that have flaws and weaknesses. And if we're successful trainers and we appreciate the strong points of the dogs, and, and have good technical skills to help the dogs cope with their weak points, we can have absolutely great dogs. And in some cases, dogs that you don't think of as really good police dogs are actually highly effective animals. They really, really do their job. And other dogs, so for, uh, I used to teach a seminar about the distinction between aggression and prey, defense, uh, fighting drive, prey drive, all that kind of stuff based on riser, right? All I was doing was, was stealing risers material. And uh, at one point, I, I was doing a seminar for a, a Florida Police Department, actually a, a Florida region of USPCA. And I was working with that threat approach that was shown me by Len Masana, right? So if you want to access aggression in a dog, and I think at that time in police dogs, we didn't have a lot of real high quality dogs. Um, we tended to have a whole bunch of second class dogs and sometimes third class dogs. And if I have that kind of dog, then I want one that's a little on the sharp side. So I want to work with the dog's aggression, teach him how to handle aggressive situations, teach him to take control of them, teach him to manage his own stress, all that kind of stuff. And so these guys had this perfect setup where they had a horse barn with stalls. And there was like a faucet in the back going drip, 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 drip. And they could bring the dogs in this, this gloomy uh, barn from one end. And I would do a threat approach on the dog from the other end. And we saw all kinds of interesting stuff. There were, there were some dogs in that crew that had had many, many bites. Like one guy, I asked him after I worked his dog, I asked him, has your dog had any bites? And the guy pulls out his wallet and goes like, and the plastic things go Boof! with like 20 <laughs> bites over. Of what his shit. dog had done to people and his dog messed people up right and so there were some veteran police dogs like this that had been in big fights with people and and being in a big fight with a dog with somebody will change a dog right it'll make them a different yeah. dog and so there were some dogs that were showing what for me were interesting and unusual behaviors because i'd seldom worked with dogs that had had 30 bites 40 bites 50 bites right and um and there were a couple of dogs that just shouldn't be on the street at all. And then there was the highest quality dog in the whole seminar was a big Malinois male who bit like a beast and with a huge mouth and had a tremendous entry on the decoy and all that kind of stuff. But he had a really, really bad flaw because all of that stuff can be based on, on prey, right? All that stuff can be based on prey because a suit can just be prey. A person can just be prey if they, if they want to make themselves prey. And what happened when we did this dog is I couldn't get the dog's attention because when the dog came in, they practiced a bunch of building search with the dog. When the dog came in, the handler set up, holding the leash, looking down the aisle at me and I was going to approach. And the problem was there was a door right there. And the dog registered on the door, the closed door and said, oh, it's a building search. And he started to bark at the door and try to move towards the door. And nothing I could do would draw his attention. And that includes giving him a sting with a whip, grabbing his tail, pulling him off the ground. So I got this dog by the tail off the ground. The handler's holding the front end. I'm holding the back end. I'm pulling on it. I let go of him. What does he does do? He goes back to the door, right? So that's a really brave dog, right? No stress at all. That's a super courageous animal. But he wasn't very disposed to bite people for real. He needed yeah. stimuli to help him, to support him, all that kind of stuff. The technical problem of getting him to bite somebody was going to be more difficult than other dogs at the seminar who weren't as high quality as he was, but were actually much better disposed to be trained uh, as biting dogs by most of us with normal skills, right? Very interesting to hear all that. Um, there's going to be tons of people wanting to, to listen to this piece because you don't usually get to hear every single minute detail of someone's opinion yeah. on these two different things. Because this is like two. This is like one of the biggest topics in police dogs. 
<laughs> well, yeah, and it, it, the, the conversation has changed a lot because the quality of dog available is much higher than it was 30 years ago. So if I taught a police dog seminar 20 years <laughs> ago, 30 years ago, normally I would see there are a couple of really nice dogs in the class that I would be happy to own. Then there's a whole bunch of second class dogs who do the job and some of them are even cool dogs that are they're highly effective and then there's too many third class dogs that i'm not sure will keep their officers safe right i don't yeah. don't feel good about those dogs so it was normal for me to see that kind of profile most of the dogs at the seminar were dogs say if you ask me do you want that dog as your street patrol dog i go uh -uh. so but in the years after i started to see like I'd go teach a police dog seminar, there'd be 20 dogs there and I'd be happy to own 12 of them, right? And, yeah. and that's kind of the way it's been going. And that may change your answer to, do you want a first class dog or a dog with a little flaw or weakness? Because the first class dogs are, they're not common, but they're becoming more and more common. And then the question is how to deal with them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that kind of finishes up that question. We're going we're gonna to have some serious material here. So <laughs> what um, other questions? You said you might want to talk about some additional stuff. Well, I'll anything? tell you what. Do you, do you want to do another edition of this? Yeah, sure. Okay. So let's, I'll tell you what. Let's set another one up, plan some questions. Um, I'm kind of losing my voice, and I got something I got to do in a little while. So uh, why yeah. don't we break this one off and process it and make it available to people and then plan the next one? That sounds like a perfect idea. Okay. Um, so you're going to stop the record. Is that 12 year old? <laughs> is, is he going to show you how we're going to be able to upload it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might have to call him. I might have to call him. But okay, I think cool. I got the main thing is that I, I have it on my computer, right? Sure. Um, so when I end the meeting, I'll find out if I have it on my computer. And I think I will because the last segment was there. Okay. Okay. All right, Doc, go get your stuff done. I got duty. I got to okay. go to duty tonight. Thank all you. Right. It's been a pleasure. And all you guys out there who, who handle and train uh, military working dogs, uh, male and female, um, I hope this has been helpful. I hope above, above all, it stimulates your like intellectual interest in dogs because I know a few kind of untutored geniuses, people who aren't deep thinkers, but they're super, super successful at dog training. But most of the people I know who are really successful at dog training are, are bright people who think on a very deep level about dogs. And so you're not just, as, as you develop as a dog trainer, you're not just becoming better at techniques and getting more experience and all kinds of stuff like that. You're learning to inquire more and more deeply into the business of molding behavior and working dogs, right? And, and developing theoretical structures and testing one structure against another one to see which one works best for you. So if, if you ask me what I hope for from this, this kind of interview is to not necessarily have people adopt my opinions, but to have people start to think and develop their own opinions that they can support if you ask them to, right? Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. I'm every day. <laughs> All right, Doc. Thanks okay. again, man. I appreciate it. Peace out, dude. Later, man. Bye. Bye.